for it. There are two things here. We do have people, as, as Jason mentioned, who are on the Standards Committee and Joseph. We also have, now there is this Linux toolchain mailing list, which is now a combined place for both all toolchains, including GCC and LLVM, to have conversations. And that's another place where we seem to have common discussions about interpretations and how the toolchain should work, cooperate or, or be consistent amongst them. So, but My impression was, if I remember the constant volatile discussion correctly, that LLVM was putting them in a read-only section and GCC wasn't. So what I was saying was, uh, was I think the interpretation where you do put them in a read-only section is reasonable. I also think, arguably, this is one of the things where maybe <coughs> you consider it to be an ABI issue. There are various things on the margins of should this be considered an ABI. And I'm guessing maybe you don't really have a PSABI group for BPF but perhaps you should talk to a PSABI group if one exists. I think we need to support you and go to the Linux toolchain list and have a conversation with all the other toolchains. There is also a libc coord list on OpenWall for FreeBSD, Muscle, glibc, uh, LVM libc to go and coordinate uh, cross issues, and we raise issues on that list all the time. So if you also find POSIX or ISO C conformance issues in the library, come talk to one of the lead developers on the project, like Jason, or come talk to me. We will take it to libc Quard and we'll have that coordinated discussion with all the other libraries. So I, I do think we can support you, right? I don't, I don't think you should be the intermediary between the communities, is, is what I think. I, like, I'm subscribed to libc Quart. I don't know if I'm subscribed to Linux toolchains, though. Is that a um, upstream kernel list? I don't... Yeah. Uh, I'm, I'm on Linux API, though. So Linux API was uh, for, like, libc kernel API design. So I'm on that, which means that I'm monitoring if there's new APIs that we then have to implement in user space, and then the various libraries implement their interfaces differently. We can have a broad conversation on libc Quart, Linux API, or at this point, Linux toolchain. But we should be helping you. I think the answer is yes. Yeah, so if it's, say, uh, a C++ standard issue, then once, once it goes to the reflector, um, then the, the Clang developers are also on, on that. And so that, that's, a, that's a forum for discussion between uh, the different implementations about, uh, impl about uh, questions of the, of the language standard and the various lists for other things. So once, once the question has gone to the reflector and had some discussion there, then if you, uh, then you can refer to that if you need to uh, talk to. Is the reflector public though? Uh, no, it's, it's not, but it's, yeah. that's why I'm saying, like ask, ask, ask uh, someone to raise it, raise the issue. Okay, so to be clear here, I don't mind to go back and forward from one community to the other. The problem is that when you suggest people, when you ask people to change long established behavior, everyone hates you at the end of the end. So at the end of the you know, I mean, the, the LVM people hate you and your own people hate you too, right, at the end. So they say, for example, in this case, oh, we asked the reflectors and they say that they don't feel that this footnote, you know, about this constable that is, have you seen that discussion? because they have not provided any proof of it neither. They just say, oh, they told us this, right? Now, at that point, I can't maintain the discussion myself. So that was, if, if we could improve in this, because it happened. Yeah, um, so uh, there is in this, this uh, uh, Linux toolchains uh, mailing list, um, and it has been useful uh, to communicate with the how the kernel people <laughs> interpret uh, a couple of uh, corner cases. Um, but maybe there should be a direct uh, 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 my feeling is on that mailing list the, the kernel people are in the middle. So maybe this should be also another uh, uh, coordinated uh, toolchain. What if 
So, so I, I think uh, I think that Joseph's comments was was probably the most useful. That you could see your your concrete problem as part of the ABI, and basically say, okay, that's the reference implementation I have to follow the ABI, and propose a GCC fix to just fix your target because of to match the ABI, and that's that's what we can accept because it only affects BPF. And, and just leave aside if there's a strict specification that requires those variables to be there or here. Because it's probably, there's uh, none. yeah, there's none. So, and, and there's probably going to be, oh, well, let's make it implementation defined. And then that doesn't help you either. So in some cases, you have a standards body that can answer questions for you. So when Muscle and GLibc run into interpretation issues, we file Austin group tickets in order to get the POSIX IEEE standards uh, committee to say, yes, this is a way we would go. Yes, we would change the language this way in the standard. And I, like, I agree with Jason. I think this has to go to the reflector. There needs to be international community discussion over like, what should an implementation do? However, the international community might say, eh, it's implementation dependent, right? And then now you have two different implementations. Um, so you're not wrong that there could possibly be like we have libc cord. It could just be Linux toolchain is the list to have a community discussion over, hey, guess what? The international community says they can't make up their minds on this issue and you get to choose yourself because you're an implementation. So at that, at that point, we just have to have a conversation between the toolchains. I think Linux toolchain is as good as any. Like if I just invent a rando list on open wall that's like, you know, toolchain cord, it wouldn't be any better than just going to talk on Linux toolchain and making sure that the LVM developers are on Linux toolchain, making sure GCC developers are on Linux toolchain, and that we're reading and following Linux toolchain, just like I read and follow Linux API or libc cord to coordinate with the BSD libc's and muscle and, and other libc's. Like, is that, a, is, that, is that what you're thinking? Is that like a better answer for the process? I will just well, well, no, 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 but, but I think the, uh, the, the other thing is that, I mean, maybe we need to be clearer about who are the representatives on the standards committees or at least have access to the reflectors. So that's just a communication issue. But I mean, this, you know, for, for awareness, and we can also try to reiterate it here, as Jason did, that Jason and Joseph are, you know, the, the experts that people don't know on the standards, and those are the people that you should CC on Bugzilla or you know contact with, and as long as it doesn't get overwhelming for them, that that's you know the, the people should be the front line for this. You can make a how-to standards list, like all the standards and the people that are connected to it. Sorry, we can make a how-to standards list because I think like the community is large enough that you might not know who to go to. Like I read every one of Joseph's posts on the reflector because I'm on SC22 from the Canadian side, so I do get to vote. As a, as a P member for Canada for WG14. So I also read those things. So if you wanted me to raise anything from a Canadian side, if you're Canadian, eh? Like, I, I'm supposed to represent both industry, uh, academia, and, and, and individuals, eh? So. Another approach could, of course, be that for every interpretation that's open and interesting to our community, we have a Bugzilla report. Because at least it's, it's tracked then on our own side. So I, I was asked yesterday to, I don't know, to talk about, uh, uh, so, you know, this is representing somebody else, uh, GFDL again. So, <laughs> given that there's no other conversation out here. So, how are we gonna solve GFDL? Okay, next question. <laughs> Better explain the, uh, the limitations on the, our, our documentation and being able to uh, update it or process it. <laughs> because of the, the... Yeah, yeah, but I'll catch back to so I was one of the people who stirred this up, and we have talked about it before. The problem is with inline documentation in GPL licensed code that GPL and GFDL are not compatible. So you, 
I'd love to have you know, documentation that was generated off the code, Doxygen or whatever. I would also love to have um, verifiable documentation where if I've got an example in the documentation, part of the testing of the documentation is all the examples still work. Actually, we do an astonishingly good job of that given it's all done by hand and the GCC manual, if you print it out, I think it's 600 pages long. So it's astonishing we keep it good, but it would nice, be nice to automate that. And Jeremy, here are your stickers. Excellent question, excellent ex explanation. <laughs> Just as another data point, in the kernel documentation, we have, after conversation with Linux Foundation lawyers, had to basically disallow GFDL licensing of the kernel documentation because once you process it through Sphinx, you're integrating the source code, which is GPL, with some GPL, GFDL documentation and then you have a license conflict. So we, we just disallow that. Persuade the FSF to issue a new version of GFDL that allows relicensing as GPL, like the thing they did to allow Wikipedia to relicense from GFDL to Creative Commons. I don't think we have any FSF people here, but persuading the FSF to sort things out would sort this thing out for everything that's JFDL licensed, at least as long as it has the any later version clause. My understanding of the situation in GCC is that we avoid this problem by uh, making sure that uh, documentation strings that are shared between code and the documentation go into both at the same time. Haven't we created a problem for ourselves there by not requiring copyright assignment anymore? Because the, the copyright owners have to also license um, relicensing. That, uh, that was a question uh, raised in, uh, in the, the move to, to allow contribution to the DCO, and he decided that uh, just making sure that the, the, doc the strings were in both places at the same time avoided that problem. Yeah, and in, in terms of what to do with it, um, I mean, I think part of the question was, you know, that you know, the GNU tool chain still remains, you know, a, partnering, working with the Free Software Foundation. I mean, it uses GPL just as the, the kernel does, but it's not a separate project. So, you know, it, there, there is, is more uh, delicate balance that we need to, you know, to just declare that we're going to somehow not follow the policy. So as, as we discussed before, this needs to be an issue that we work through with the Free Software Foundation as to how to, uh, how to uh, thread that needle. So I would imagine we can try tracking down everybody that contributed a GFDL licensed uh, documentation and ask them to relicense and delete all the rest and just start over with a doc GPL, whatever, and just abandon the old versions and just hope for that, that the most important parts of the documentation can be relicensed because I mean we, we we didn't give up our copyrights so we can still contribute under under explicitly under a different license, right? Yes, that is one solution. Um, this actually segues into a question I wanted to ask the people here. Um, I've been dragging my feet with the bin utils. We currently only accept copyright assigned contributions, but people have been asking for DCO. If I do that, does anyone have any objections? Does anyone think DCO is a bad idea? Oh, or you're just raising your hand voting, or you're raising your hand to comment? Both. Both. <laughs> um, I, I, I personally like uh, having uh, 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 something like the FSF behind uh, my contributions. And um, 
Uh, um, and I think the DCO, at least how uh, uh, it's uh, currently used, uh, uh, makes it really difficult to track uh, who the actual copyright holders are of your contribution. Because the DCO uh, tracks uh, the authors, but not the copyright holders. And then uh, your project becomes this yeah, I don't know who holds the copyright on this. And, th and, th and that's what I'm... Uh, uh, the, uh, I, I think if, if the DCO was changed to be explicit about who the copyright holder was, then uh, I would support it. Um, so, aside from the practical issues that, that Mark talked about, um, there is an issue about the agreements in place with the GNU project and the FSF. Um, just yesterday, I, I heard from someone that the GCC steering committee had pretty much tore up the, torn up the agreement that was in place. I thought that was an exaggeration. But is it? I mean, it, uh, are the, the agreements that were in place going to be completely ignored? Or, or, or uh, and do we have to start over and, 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 and put new agreements in place? Or, or can we still count on, on, on them? And, and, and we, uh, I speak as both uh, a member of the GNU toolchain uh, developer group and uh, of, of the GNU advisory committee. So I'm on both sides and I'm very confused about the present situation. And this question goes right into the, 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 the issue. The, are, are the agreements worth anything at, at this point? Can we still count on them or, 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 or not? The agreements with b between GNU and, and the GCC steering committee; those were very formalized. In my understanding, I don't know the details about what they state, but I understand that there there were agreements in place. I I was also involved in in in, in let's say the constitution of the current uh, team of GLBC maintainers. Uh, so. Um, I'm aware of some of the arrangements and, and of some of the prob communication problems that we faced during that time. I don't know about Bin Utils specifically, maybe it's different, but in my understanding Bin Utils was always very much part of the GNU project without any special arrangements. So, so um, that, that, that would be the default agreement. Uh, which, which in, in, in the case of many utils involves uh, assigning copyrights to the FSF, specifically bringing it back to this, uh, to to the issue that was being discussed initially. I think there's actually a strong argument that the FSF tore up the agreement back in 2009 because there was, I, I'd say there was an implicit duty when we were saying the FSF would handle legal arrangements that they would do it in a reasonably expeditious way. And when they were introducing long delays in releasing GCC 4.4 while they tried to decide details of the LibGCC license exception and how to handle plugins. I think the FSF was basically failing in their implied responsibilities in the agreement. So I think there's a reasonable argument that the FSF was failing to keep at least to the spirit of their side of the agreement as far back as 2009 and the delays to the release of GCC 4.4.
With GCC in particular, there's also the, uh, the history of uh, the, the eggs uh, project that uh, the, I think the, the agreement kind of uh, making uh, eggs again, GNU GCC, as a, as a, I think, a, a looser agreement than perhaps some other projects might have. Um, I, I think it, it um, how do you say this? Well, m most people have a problem with Richard Stallman. And I think, well, <laughs> sorry, some. No, but, okay. No, but, but thank you, thank you. The, the, it's, um, um, uh, and that, uh, and him being president of the FTF uh, uh, and uh, 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 the leader of uh, GNU uh, made things difficult. Um, uh, I, I think we should uh, try to uh, see our uh, connection with the FSF uh, uh, separate from that um, uh, lingering. Uh, um, uh, 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 there is a uh, 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 new leadership at the FSF. Um, uh, 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 maybe you saw the, um, uh, the message from uh, Zoe Koiman. Uh, uh, on the overseers uh, list uh, uh, when we started talking to the conservancy. Um, uh, and I admit that I have a <laughs> advantage that I'm that and she's that, so that makes communication <laughs> somewhat easier. But um, uh, I, I, I think the, the, the FSF uh, uh, might be much more reasonable than uh, some of us uh, uh, expect. At least <laughs> uh, I thought, uh oh, I have to talk to the executive director of the FSF and this is going to be terrible. It wasn't. <laughs> uh, so maybe we should talk more <laughs> in that. I mean, it's you know, a very good statement. I mean, there have been conversations by you know, Carlos and I and others with Zoe as well. And I mean, we definitely want to have an open communication with the FSF and are trying to cooperate and, and you know, find common ground. And uh, also, you know, the GCC steering committee, I mean, people can disagree about you know, how it's actually formed, how it, it you know, all, all of the democracy, secrecy, whatever we want people to believe or, or not believe about it, but the stewards and the GCC steering committee have been appointed with the approval of the GNU project, the FSF, uh, to and work in the best interest and represent the community and represent the FSF for the best interest of the project. And I think that we all believe that we are uh, approaching that uh, in good faith and trying to do things in the best interest of the project with that uh, uh, authority and appointment that we have. So, you know, and there, you know, people may not know it, but there's been a great deal of effort, at, I mean, on my part, I mean, I can speak for myself and, uh, and all of us to really try to preserve that relationship and try to uh, balance the issues of the community, of the project and of, the GNU project of the FSF not trying, and, and lots of, uh, at least we feel, or I feel, you know, a lot of uh, um, you know, ex extensive effort and, and really, you know, all I can say, just, just a lot of effort to try to ensure that we don't come across as um, you know, partisan on, on either side of this, that we aren't trying to explicitly, you know, 
choose one side or the other, harm one side or the other. This is trying to ensure that we find a balance because as, as Mark, as you mentioned others, there are people with very strong views about the projects. I mean, to, to, to put it mildly, there are people with very strong views on both sides of this and we're trying to find a way to keep this an inclusive project for all of these different views and keep people who are, as I said at the very beginning, an incredible team, and again, you should really applaud yourself. I mean, this project has been going on for 30 plus years and continues to be you know, a major you know, foundation of this entire GNU Linux ecosystem. And it's, you know, this project is now essentially the basis running the world. I mean, you know, cloud, everything. I mean, understand that you know, there's you know, trillions of dollars at least of economy that all runs on this, on these great people, these great companies, great volunteers. And we're trying to find a balance to ensure that the GNU tool chain continues to remain you know, in that strong position to be able to provide this high quality production level tool chain that's the basis for companies, all these, you know, Red Hat, SUSE, Canonical, all these different, you know, and I'm not, you know, I'm sorry for all the distributions I'm leaving out and, and the BSDs who were previously using that and Mac OS, I mean, they're, and Google and you know, Facebook, everybody who, you know, is or was using it and, and relied on this. And so we're trying to find that balance, you know, thread that needle so that we can maintain this great collection of people from all these companies who are essentially for the GNU Toolchain project volunteers. I mean, they're paid by various companies or they may be independent developers or freelancers or whatever, but they're contributing to this and continuing to make this a tremendously important, respected project. And we want to ensure that all of those people continue to participate. And so we are mainly trying to find ways to that not everybody's going to be happy with every single decision, but try to find that balance where we can ensure that all of these really core people, and because it's, it's, you know, we have, it's, it's great that we have this, you know, all the people here in person, the people who are online. I mean, there are a lot of people who are here, the developers, a lot of people who aren't here, but it's not, you know, a cast of, of tens of thousands of developers that we have. I mean, there's some very core critical people that make this project run, and we want to ensure that these people still feel comfortable participating. Um, Nick, did you get an answer to your DCO question somewhat? <laughs> <laughs> um, yeah, I, I think what I'm going to do is allow DCOs, but uh, with um, a, an extra line saying who holds the copyright. Sure. Yeah. Uh, I think that's that's put in quite a burden on those signing that DCO because knowing who owns the copyright of what you authored is probably dependent on where you're living, on where your employer is. Say so it's it's a legal question and you're putting the burden on asking the legal question to the contributor that might turn them off. Because I, if, 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 if I would, would need to say who owns the copyright, I'm not actually sure. If in Germany uh, I, I re retain my copyright because there is something like that, or if my employer also has, so it, there might be multiple people that have rights to your code. So it's, it's a very difficult question. So. Hi. Exactly. Uh, uh, no, no, that, that's exactly the. I mean, I think we're all saying that. Look, for all the people here, because you know, working on any part of the tool chain. I mean, and Richard is you're an incredibly brilliant person. I mean, again, thank you. For, no, no, I mean, I mean, but, but yeah, I'm just saying for the the people who are able to understand these various specifications for the languages, understand, if you can understand the back end of GCC, you can figure out legally who owns the code, the copyright. So, so it, it's it's very easy for me because I, uh, the, the company has designed some disclaimer, you know. So, and, and so, so that's basically you would require in the DCO if if people contribute in time that they are paid for doing that to require to have signed disclaimers from whomever. Yeah. So basically, you have the the other way of the FSF copyright assignment. Go. Right. Yeah. If, so. you, if, if you do a copyright assignment for a DCO, then why have a DCO at all? Correct. Yeah, I mean, I, I re appreciate it can be difficult to work out who, who owns the copyright, but you need to do that if you're going to contribute that way. You know, I, I'm not going to make it easy for you to ignore the law. Jeremy. 
when we originally discussed adopting DCO internally in the steering committee, we did discuss the question of should we use standard DCO or a variant with things such as provisions for allowing certain kinds of relicensing. And at that time, we concluded the advantages of doing the standard DCO that people know from many other projects outweighed whatever disadvantages there might be in the standard DCO. No, no, I've, I've, already, I've already got enough stickers, thank you. Um, but the, um, so I want to just change the topic, which is... Um, I want to get feedback, because this is the first cauldron where we have charged a ticket price. And the thinking for this was that we were getting feedback from our sponsors that said, it's jolly hard raising sponsorship, but it's very easy for us as corporate people to pay for tickets, and therefore it's an easier way of raising money. Um, now, it turned out this year that our sponsors were incredibly generous, which is why we've only charged £50 um, for, for the ticket. I'd just like to get feedback as to whether people are still comfortable with us going down that route of how we fund this uh, project, because it is a first-time experiment. And, and I'll also just mention, I mean, with, with that introduction, that with the GNU Toolchain Fund, has travel grants and continues to provide travel grants for people who are you know, freelancers, don't have the funds to attend. And we also, uh, with the, again, the generous sponsors and the fees that people paid, we were providing uh, complimentary uh, registration for students and people here. So, it, you know, that for anybody in the future, be aware that that shouldn't be any restriction to attending if you're you know, truly a contributor or you know, have a, you know, want, want to be able to participate in the, the community, that we welcome that sort of participation. But uh, anybody have a comment either in the audience about uh, the fees? I mean, as, as Jeremy said, I, mean, I think that there is, at least I mean, I've heard that, that it's a lot easier or it's a lot more in um, the, the expense reporting expense of, of companies to be able to pay a, uh, a conference fee of some sort than this, this sponsorship. But I think it's, uh, but it, you know, it, it's, and um, I mean, let, we're a small community, I mean, I'll just, you know, I'll, I'll say, I mean, assuming this, that, you know, we, we can balance things out. I mean, if there are, you know, some company is uh, better able to handle this through a, uh, a sponsorship, as Jeremy mentioned, and then we can go back and sort of, you know, rebate the fees. I mean, and or make you know, give all of those companies sort of still charge a fee, but have a complimentary. I mean, it, it's this is again with the great work of Jeremy and his team, able to uh, adapt and sort of personalize this as necessary. Can someone give comparison figures for other events, like what's the fee for the LLVM conference? So, is there anyone here who's paying their own way and not being, not have corporate behind them? I see three raised hands. Did, did we, did we subsidize you? Is that good? Did we, did we help support you? Uh, did you ask? Did you ask? <laughs> please, please ask. Like you, we want to be inclusive. We don't, we don't want to have to have you pay. Like. There are people here supporting you, so if, if you paid your way, please come to the committee and just, just ask for support. Like, I mean, we're, yeah, we're, no, I, I, I mean, it, man, like, subsidies are hard. It's an emotional question about asking. Um, I, I went once to a Linux Foundation event where I had to ask for money, and it, it's hard to do, right? Like, it's, a, it's an emotional thing to reach out to the committee and say, look, I want to give this talk. I don't have enough money to do this thing. I'm doing something else. And like, can you support me? But at the same time, like, you know, that's what we're here for. We're here to support you. So I hope you, you feel okay asking. Yeah. And again, I'm, uh, you know, Jeremy, you know, and, and we all agree in, in sort of the purposes. We want to make this inclusive. We want to make this, you know, a, a you know, not you know, bare bones, but, but uh, unlike some of these other organizations, I mean, we're not trying to use this conference as a fundraising event. I mean, it's not paying for administrativity. It's not paying for the, the foundation or anything else beyond the event. So that's why we're able to do this in a very cost-effective manner. So, um, I mean, you know, that... Not, not saying that we tend to change it. If, if the, again, we're trying to 
adapt and respond to the community. If the community wants something different, if they want this to be, um, maybe as we have discussed, um, you know, if we should shift this to being co-located with, you know, adjacent to the Linux Plumbers Conference, um, because there is a lot of overlap and it has been very effective uh, to coordinate, have the conversations with LPC and to not be jumping around to different locations. But as we just mentioned, I mean, the LPC is a, the fees for that are more expensive. I mean, the whole way that the Linux Foundation operates in that sense is, is a different financial model, a different business model, um, which is fine. I mean, it's self-consistent, but I mean, it, it's a matter of whether that's the right balance for our community or not. But, you know, for the time being, we're, we're as, as with Jeremy and the great leadership that, uh, I don't know, I guess it is, it, is it, I mean, Jeremy, we, we now have the, the organization in the UK set up to, to host this, which um, Carlos and I and, and Joel are, are uh, co-trustees or whatever the appropriate term is, sorry, or. So for the first 10 years, this is run by the organizing company holding the money, or in some cases, Embercosm holding the money for them. Now, we're honest, honestly, but you know, it doesn't look brilliant. So we have set up a community interest company in the UK. And the reason for using the UK is because I live in the UK, and no other reason. And that, incidentally, why is why the fee was in pounds. Um, and the idea is that that will be a lightweight legal entity to hold the money and with a, basically a group of directors which are the key players in the foundation and the key people organized. So Honza will be a director, uh, Carlos, David. And, but we'll still use the same model, which is whoever is hosting, and that's perhaps a question for the end of this, of this session, um, we'll do all the organization and then we'll you know, just hand over the money. But we have a legal entity there. And you can go and look it up on Companies House. GNU, GNU, Cauldron, GNU Tools Cauldron CIC. But anyways, as, as I was saying that we have this set up here and we can change the, change the financial, who's, oh, change the financial balance of what we want to do with the agreement of the community. If we want this to, uh, you know, for, for that to be a holder of additional money for other beneficial purposes, I mean, with whatever is, is legally allowed, I mean, we can figure out if we want to make this a, you know, a, a, a uh, you know, uh, you know, host vacations for the <laughs> team, or, you know, whatever we want to do with this. Which I, I'm joking. I'm joking, everybody. Um, but, you know, figure out what balance we want with the finances and, and the, the luxury and, you know, exactly how we want the conference to operate. I mean, this is a community effort. Yeah, so, the, the, so part of this year I found it difficult because you hadn't figured it out yet. Um, so it was, luckily my, my company just said whatever they charge, we'll pay it. But if <laughs> my company wouldn't have said that, then uh, uh, this year probably would have been kind of difficult to attend because it, it well, next year we'll figure it out <laughs> earlier. Um, I, I do think there is a, a difference between uh, $50 and $300. There. So, uh, what I wanted to say about uh, asking uh, uh, for, for money is hard. <laughs> uh, what you uh, 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 offer is say if you want to give a lightning talk or uh, 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 um, make it a bit if you present something then of course you are welcome to ask for uh, and I, I, I think uh, especially uh, students would uh, then easier uh, uh, say, uh, say, hey, I will come and give a lightning talk on m my involvement. Yeah, that, I think that would be uh, really nice. Well, of course, with this year's 50 pounds of entrance fee, the travel costs for anybody not living in Prague is going to be much higher than this entrance fee. So they, if they also can ask for travel uh, reimbursement, that would probably be a more generous offer. In this year, uh, no, I'm not sure how it's going to be next year. 
You know, but again, as we said, that the GNU Toolchain Fund, which is separate from this, but at the FSF with the Work Together Fund, we have funds that are able to provide travel, you know, assistance for uh, people who are independent, don't have corporate sponsorship, to be able to travel. To so we're trying to ensure that that everybody can participate who needs to. And as as Jeremy, well, I mean. I've, I know, but I mean, to mention, or maybe this is what you're saying, but, you know, following on what Mark said next year, uh, as, as Jeremy reminded me before, we really are interested in, if anybody is interested in uh, hosting the Cauldron next year in their wonderful, beautiful city, uh, please contact Jeremy, Hans, and I uh, about that. We're definitely interested in uh, trying to find another location and who could help with the logistics of that. So uh, there is interest in this, and please, you know, think, talk amongst your, you know, corporate uh, organizations if they'd be able to or, you know, interested in providing that sort of resource and assistance. So, you know, this is a, a call for, for sites, I guess, or a call for hosting. Uh, and please let us know at your earliest convenience if you're interested in hosting Cauldron next year so that we can have another uh, wonderful, productive meeting like this uh, entire three days. Um, so is, any, is there something else, Jeremy, you want, or that was the topic? We did explicitly consider speaker. We didn't achieve what we wanted to do, which was to enable those who needed support to be supported. The whole point of this is to talk if you want to talk, okay? If you come from a multi-billion corporate, you don't, whether or not you're talking, you need a subsidy. Uh, we have, it's great to have so many, but for, for talk's sake, by money. Sorry, very quickly then. Um, eight minutes left. Oh, that's, that's fine. Um, speaking as a maintainer, I'm struggling these days to keep on track of all the GCC patches that are coming in. The mailing list is huge. What can we do to improve that so that we don't lose patches? I know that GLibc is using patchwork, um, but we don't in GCC. I looked at it yesterday. We've got 4,000 patches in patchwork. Um, dating back, and that's just the last two years, none of them being closed. So we could have a speed reading session at the con cauldron? Maybe, no, okay. <laughs> well, the, the we all have to use Hi, uh, this is Sadesh. Can you hear me? Yes. We can hear you, Sadesh. Go ahead. Perfect. So, uh, since John is not there, I thought, I thought I'd uh, chime in on his behalf for uh, GCC and Patchwork. So, we did try. And uh, we tried using some of the automation uh, that we use in GLibc to uh, mark patches as, as committed or, uh, well, committed is pretty much it uh, when it comes to automation. And we found that it just doesn't work for GCC. Uh, because there's uh, there's a certain amount of uh, developer uh, involvement that is required to make sure that the automation works. Uh, for example, whatever you post on li list has to be the exact same thing that you commit uh, to uh, to patchwork. So uh, to, to the uh, repo. So that is clearly not there. Uh, I mean, even when it comes to GLibc, we have uh, somewhere around 70% uh, there. <laughs> Even we are not like 100% sanitized as far as that uh, behavior is concerned. So yeah, to, to answer your question with respect to patchwork, uh, we have tried. I think John continues to try, uh, but uh, it's it's just not able to catch up with the volume of, of the patches and uh, the percentage of patches that actually uh, something, some automation that might be able to catch. Yeah, so there are some community behaviors that make it... Again, it's on. There are some community behaviors that make it hard to automate the process. And if we tweaked those behaviors a little bit, it would enable 
some better automation and better use of the tools if you want to. So I use Patchwork before anybody was actually using it, and you can still use it to delegate patches to yourself, maintain lists, maintain bundles, and do and actually do patch application. So like there's command line clients that you pull stuff. Like if you don't want to use your inbox or an inbox, you can use command line clients for it. But the I'd say one of the the first wrinkles is committing exactly what you said you were going to commit without modifying it on the side before you commit it. And that's hard um, specifically because someone gives you a patch and they're expecting you to commit that. And yet sometimes we go behind their back and go, oh, I needed a little more change and then you change it and then you commit it. And then there's no closed loop between what the author submitted to you and what you committed as the committer. If those two things don't match, that's an, that may be an, it may be an expectation difference, um, but it, it is the one thing that makes it hard to automate commit versus what's on the mailing list, and we've been trying to improve that. Hi, can you hear me? Yeah. Yeah. Uh, uh, I, I set, set up the Pittsburgh for GCC in 2010. There are 108,501 patches in it now. Uh, the big problem is that patchwork is set up for the uh, for the Linux flow. So there's one maintainer who does, does the commits, uh, or a group of maintainers who do the commits, not not the people themselves. That's not how the patchwork tool works. Uh, what it's set set up for. So so we really need uh, a different tool, uh, just a bunch of scripts maybe that people can 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 run themselves. But, So, so, so one issue I have with like committing exactly what I post does it is does this apply to the 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 cover text of the of the commit so so the the commit message or only to the patch content? Okay, so then I'm sh I should be most of the time be fine. Well, but it's, it's also I'm I'm posting patches because we are required to post patches, but I don't need approval for my changes. So I usually say, well, I've tested them and I've pushed it. So it, it would need to, like, I'm, I'm not sure why. They, they, all the patches show up in patchwork and most of them just stay there for whatever reason. Yeah. Yeah, but uh, I also use this as an opportunity to say that we, you know, need to improve or increase the, num the, the, so the community. I mean, in both in the number of people able to do reviews so that we don't have these choke points and bottlenecks for people. We definitely want to increase the number of reviewers, increase maintainers, the steering committee, GCC, GLibc, to be able to delegate and have you know, finer granularity where possible so that we can have more reviewers to handle the volume and also you know, help with the documentation, help with you know, for, you know, how to get started. I mean, as, and, and Carlos has been you know, excellent about that. For glibc, we need the same thing for the other parts of the tool chain to make it easier to onboard developers and to in, ensure that this remains a vibrant community that's able to handle the volume and again, you know, you know maintain this uh, uh, heavily relied upon infrastructure in, uh, in tool chain that, that's underlying GNU Linux. So I'd say the, the like auto close bot that that looks at what got committed versus what's being tracked. It's just Python, right? We can write a whole bunch of, we, we can write some additional things. So, um, I mean, part of the reason I haven't reached out to GCC or Ben Utils or GDB on this is because we're still trying to refine what it looks like for glibc. But if uh, the, the next person whom I'd really bug is Jonathan Wakeley to make sure it works for libstandard C++. And if it works for libstandard C++ and we can get a process down, then we can show you we can show you what it looks like and and what to do and if there's any kind of like community tweaks so if you're committing something that's that is identical to just what you post oftentimes i just i you, if you push something that's committed then make sure that you just push exactly the same thing on the list and make sure you use scissors just so that um uh, patchwork knows like like you do scissors but everything above your scissors is just at blah 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 blah. You're having a conversation with the list about that thing, right? You can even anything above the scissors is going to get cut by the by the git scissor. I don't think the present generation of web-based pull request systems are right for the tool chain, but I could imagine 
that someone could in future come up with a system that has better tracking and isn't based entirely on the mailing list as the primary transport, even though I think there are various issues with the present generation. I could certainly imagine something better in future that addresses the problems both with mailing lists and with those centralised web-based systems. Yes, we're out of time. Well, uh, one of the reasons that uh, the exact patches as, as posted and committed doesn't work for us in, in many, t many cases is that maintainers often say the patch is okay if you change these and two lines and, and we don't bother to resend it because it's, it's, it's useless. Uh, so uh, there could be other options like trying to, um, to patch uh, patchworks so that it allows a few lines changes as, as long as most of the patch is the same, or we could uh, we have those pre-commit hooks which could check is the patch uh, matching some, something from the mailing list. If yes, tell the user, okay, I'm marking this as, as committed, otherwise please, uh, please do it yourself uh, through something, some tool or So one of the things that I'm considering doing is sending out an email if the patch that is committed does not exist in the mailing list. So you, you'll get like a pushed email. Uh, I'll try that for Lipsy Alpha. And uh, if that works, then I can I can work with John to try it for Lips to C++ and maybe with GCC in future. So as I think we're out of time now, uh, so to allow for the, the next group, but you know, we're, we're here, you know, the rest of the day. You know how to find us online, so please, happy to continue this conversation with everybody. So thanks very much for another successful. Thank you.